Here we go. <laughs> Ellen Frost is a forest and community builder who uses flowers to bring people together. She chronicles her flower adventures on her YouTube channel and her free weekly newsletter. Ellen is the owner of Local Color Flowers, a business committed to sourcing 100% locally grown flowers, unusual in the industry where nearly all cut flowers are imported or grown in California. Ellen was recognized in 2016 by the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers and with the Alan M. Armitage Award for Leadership in Her Business Success, Commitment to Locally Grown Flowers and Role in Developing the U.S. Floriculture Industry. She has mentored and supported new flower growers in Maryland for years, including a buying promise of new growers' entire first year harvest. She writes a regular column for a trade magazine, Cut Flower Quarterly. She has taught over 100 uh, design and business courses to garden clubs, flower enthusiasts, budding entrepreneurs, and students from grade school to graduate school. Ellen is now working to extend her flower-loving community online. Creative Mornings Baltimore, please help me welcome Ellen Frost. <laughs> Good morning. Is this sound okay? It's all right? All right. Hi, everyone. It is um, lovely to see. No, Maya's saying it's not right. All right, hold on. Um, this is better, right? It's better? All right, Brittany says it's better. All right, hi, everyone. It's uh, really lovely and a little bit overwhelming to see so many people that I know and love in one place <laughs> to listen to me talk about flowers. So welcome. Um, for the last few years, sure it's okay. Uh, for the last few years, I have been doing flowers for creative mornings for them to give to their speakers. And as the speaker, I did not make myself an arrangement today, but instead I thought I would make an arrangement here with you um, to kind of invite you into my creative process as I talk about um, our topic today, which is native. So in the horticulture world, um, native has a very specific meaning. Um, it's about where a flower comes from originally before there was any human intervention. Um, so if we take a tulip, for instance, tulips are native to Persia. And in the 1500s, tulips were exported to the Netherlands. And then from the Netherlands, they made their way all around the world. And eventually, they came to the United States and eventually to Maryland. These tulips were grown by my friend Jessica Todd. She's a flower farmer in Union Bridge, Maryland. Uh, her farm is called Cut Flowers by Clear Ridge and she's just about 60 miles away from Baltimore. So tulips, native to Persia, local to Baltimore. But today, I'm not gonna talk about the horticultural meaning of native because that is a different talk. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about native in the context of being rooted in place and what being rooted in place means for me and for small businesses and for our Baltimore community. So, about 20 years ago, uh, and I'm going to design while talking, so if I'm not like looking at you right away, just don't worry. Um, <laughs> about 20 years ago, I got a side gig. Um, I was working a full-time job, 9 to 5, doing affordable housing construction work. And uh, I got this side job at a vegetable farm in Baltimore County. It was called Brydenbaugh Farm. And part of the job was farming, and part of the job was working at the Towson Farmer's Market selling vegetables. And I got the job because, like a lot of people who get side gigs, my friends were doing it, and I thought it would be fun, and I thought I could make some extra money. And I didn't really have any expectations about what that job would be. I just literally thought, I'll be with my friends, and I'll have some extra cash. So I was like super pleasantly surprised at how fun working at the farmer's market is. Um, I met tons of amazing, nice people, and they were mostly farmer's market people. So some of you here today I know are farmer's market people. Chris, I'm looking at you. Um, farmer's market people are people that come out to the farmer's market 
week in and week out, whether it's raining, snowing, sunny, 90 degrees, they're there. And they've got their reusable bags and they probably say like buy local on them. And they're filled up with all of the amazing things that Baltimore has to offer. Produce, bread, flowers, all the things. Um, and these people, they could get their groceries a lot more conveniently and a lot cheaper at like the giant, right? Like they didn't have to go out of their way to go to the farmer's market. But they did because they were coming not just for the product. While the product was probably like way better than what was at the giant, um, these folks were coming for something else. They were coming for like a feeling of community they felt when they walked around the farmer's market and they saw all their farmer's market friends and they all chit chatted about recipes and asparagus and tomatoes. And they came for um, a feeling of belonging because they would go to their favorite farm stand and the farmer would say, you know, how did that recipe go last week? How did it turn out? And they came for a sense of pride in their city, right? Because if you've been to the farmer's market, you know that the farmer's market is definitely Instagrammable. Um, and people had a lot of pride in, in coming to the market and showing off what they had gotten. So I loved working at the market. What it also showed me is that there was a whole like community of people who made their living off of the land in Maryland, which I, coming from a city and always living in a city, honestly, I had not ever given much thought to where food came from. Um, and so I was amazed that there were people producing on land in our community and that there were all these people searching out that product. Of course, while I was at the market, I also met John McEwen. Um, is John's face up there? Oh, no. Um, oh, there he is. There's John. Uh, John's stall was next to my stall at the farmer's market, and John is a flower farmer. He's the first flower farmer I ever met. I didn't know flower farmers were a thing. Um, again, didn't think about it. Um, and John is a native Marylander from many generations back. Um, he, I spent most of my time working at the farmer's market talking to him, honestly. Um, Chit-chatting with him, learning about flowers. What, what's there's some somebody's waving to me. No, not you. Oh, <laughs> okay, not me. Um, so I spent most of my time chit-chatting with John, learning about flowers, and I spent all of the money I made at the farmers market buying flowers from John. <laughs> um, so there was that. Uh, <laughs> When I think back about how much money I spent on flowers then, it was... Uh, so around this time, I had also started gardening just like at my house. I was growing flowers in the yard and making little like jar arrangements and giving them away to friends. I also took the master gardening course, which I took here at Silburn with my friend Kate, who is right here. Um, I love that my master gardening friends are still my friends. Um, so even though I was learning about plants and learning about flowers, I didn't really know anything about like the cut flower industry. I didn't know even that cut flower industry was a thing or a thing you would talk about. Um, I, I mean, why would I? I was like a regular person who, you know, had no experience with flowers. I, and while now my life is sort of full of flowers, I didn't come to flowers early in my life. Uh, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, if you know anybody from Buffalo, or if you yourself is, are from Buffalo, uh, you'll know that people from Buffalo love being from Buffalo. They are very <laughs> passionate about being from Buffalo. And um, despite the fact that we are almost always the underdogs in every situation, um, even though our motto in the 80s was talk and proud, um, <laughs> We were also always sort of looked at as the butt of jokes, whether that was because of our epic snowfall or because of our lovable but absolutely dismal football team, the Buffalo Bills, <laughs> who still can make grown people cry if they hear the term wide right. So I didn't learn about flowers in Buffalo, but what I did learn was like a sense of pride in my city. Um, I felt like so much of who I was growing up was because I was from Buffalo. Um, 
But after 21 years, I decided that it was time to try something new. So when I got the job at the farmer's market, I had been working in affordable housing construction for about 15 years, both in San Francisco and here in Baltimore. Um, most of my job was um, building affordable housing and community centers, and I spent most of my time um, going to like endless community meetings and organizing tenants, and I wore like a raven's hard hat to work every day. Um, so needless to say, this path had nothing to do with me knowing about the cut flower industry. Um, it wasn't really until I came across Amy Stewart's book, Flower Confidential. Um, and if you haven't read Flower Confidential, I highly recommend it. It's really easy to read, and it is a book that absolutely 100% changed my life. Um, Flower Confidential was kind of a look at an overview, basically, of what sort of a shit show the global flower industry had become. Um, in the United States, before maybe the early 1970s, the United States um, grew all of the flowers that it sold. So any flower that was sold in the United States was coming from local flower farmers from across the country. Um, this changed pretty quickly, even though that's how it had been for hundreds of years. Um, within the span of about 25 years, that all changed. By the early 1990s, the United States was importing 80% of the flowers sold in this country. 80% of an almost $7 billion industry was now coming from Colombia and Ecuador. And Flower Confidential taught me about why these things were happening. Um, one was just changes in aviation technology. Who knew aviation technology was a thing? Um, but what it made possible was for a perishable product like flowers to be flown all over the world with the help of refrigerated planes, trains, automobiles, um, with lots of chemical preservatives included, um, and made possible, unfortunately, by a large um, number of low-wage workers that were unprotected um, from the work that they were doing. Um, the other thing about Colombia and Ecuador is that they're right along the equator, and that is perfect growing conditions for flowers. It's like 70 degrees every day, and there's exactly eight hours of sunlight every single day. But it was really a political move that changed the industry forever. In 1991, George Bush, the first George Bush, George H.W. Bush, signed something into law called the Andean Trade Preference Act. And what this did was incentivize Ecuadorian Colombian growers to stop growing cocaine and sending it to the United States. What they said was, if you grow another crop, we will import it tax-free. And what that crop was, was cut flowers. And with that one move, the entire cut flower industry in the United States was decimated. Everything changed. Thousands of flower farmers lost their farms. Hundreds of varieties of flowers that had only been grown in the United States were lost to the market forever. And when I heard this story in Flower Confidential, I was just really like moved emotionally by it. And I don't know if that's because I grew up in Buffalo where my dad worked at the steel plant, just like everybody else in Buffalo. And in the mid 80s, Bethlehem Steel, just like in Baltimore, left the city, leaving most of our population unemployed. So I don't know if that was what touched me or if it was because I knew John now. I knew John McEwen. Okay, I cry a lot. <laughs> like, all the time at everything. So don't anybody tell John McEwen that he made me cry either because I will not hear the end of it. But now that I knew John, I was starting to understand like how important his farm and his product was in our community. And now I knew why he was the only flower farmer at the farmer's market. Um, so at the end of the book, there was a story about a flower shop called Bonnie Dune Florist. And they made it into the book because they were doing something that nobody else was doing. They were sourcing their flowers locally. And up to this point, for like the last 50 or so years, 
Um, the way that florists source their flowers is to go through a wholesaler, and then the wholesaler ships those flowers in from all over the world, mostly from South America for the United States. Um, but Bonnie Dune was doing something else. They were sourcing flowers locally from farmers in their community. Of course, the catch was that they were in beautiful Santa Cruz, California. And if you've ever been to Santa Cruz, the weather is perfect, and there were still remaining flower farmers in that region. But I just had this idea that something like Bonnie Dune could work here in Baltimore. It wasn't because our weather was perfect for flowers, it wasn't. Um, and it wasn't because we had a ton of flower farmers. I actually didn't know. I only knew one flower farmer. Um, but I had this idea that it could work. Um, of course, I was totally naive into thinking that this was a good idea. Um, I had barely started studying anything about flowers in master gardening. I had never even known anyone who had started a business, much less a flower business. Um, and then there was the price of local flowers. Local flowers are amazing. They are also more expensive than commodity flowers that are shipped in cheaply from South America. Um, but I wasn't deterred. I still thought it was a good idea. And the, the extra dumb part of this story is that my friends and I read this book together and we were like really, um, like we had a lot of anxiety. We were like, we have to hurry up and start the business because somebody's gonna read this obscure flower book and steal our idea. <laughs> I mean, obviously. And let's just be clear what the idea was. The idea was to start a flower shop with local flowers only. Flowers that were more expensive, harder to get, seemingly only available six months of the year. Um, and I was gonna market those flowers to like a very small niche of people in Baltimore who probably liked the idea for them, but could not afford to buy them all the time. So needless to say, nobody beat us to the punch on that idea. Um, <laughs> There are still only a few florists across the country that source all of their flowers locally. Um, and when I started to tell people in Baltimore what my idea was, people said like straight out, straight to my face, it'll never work. Um, the thing that you are um, proposing, they had just like ton tons of questions. Like what if there's a blizzard? What if there's a hurricane? Are there enough farmers? Who would buy these flowers? I, d I didn't know, I don't know. I, I didn't have a plan. Um, <laughs> What I did know is that the question that they always asked that I had an answer to was why local? Why do you have to go all in on local? Why can't you just do some local? Why can't you just source normally and then fill in with local flowers? And for me, that answer was easy because local flowers supported local growers. And that was the number one thing I was thinking. Um, it, Buying Local celebrated all of the things that were in our community already. Um, it gave people in our community jobs. It kept money circulating in our community. Um, and somehow, I just had the idea, even though I didn't know how yet, I had the idea that local flowers would bring people together. And so I jumped in, and that was 16 years ago. Um, local Color Flowers today is a flower shop. Uh, even though the mural on our wall at the shop would tell you different, we are more than a flower shop. We do all the things that florists do, but we do them with local flowers. So all of our flowers come from farms within 100 miles of Baltimore um, year round, and we source from as close to home as we can. So our closest grower, Maya, is here today. Um, Maya's farm is less than a mile from our shop. She delivers to me probably three times a week um, in, a busy, in a busy time. Um, and then our furthest grower is about 100 miles away in the foothills of the Shenandoah. That's Bob Wollum, that's him. Uh, he turned 84 this week and he still delivers flowers. He still grows flowers, he's amazing. Um, so we source flowers the way flowers were sourced for hundreds of years before technology and globalization changed things. Small farms grew flowers. They brought them to the city to a florist. The florist sold them to customers. The supply chain was very small. It was very intimate. 
and honestly, it was rooted in place. And that is the thing that I was trying to hold on to. Um, so let me tell you, because my arrangement is getting full, um, just a little bit about my designs. Um, everything we design sort of reflects what's happening in nature in our region on any given day. So much of um, what we have up here today, actually Christina just told me that the pussy willows were blooming outside. Much of what you see here today you'll find in the gardens here at Silburn. You'll find in your own gardens. Um, it is a celebration of what we have here in Baltimore. And if um, any of you who have been to my shop on Saturday mornings, you'll know that I love to design flowers and I also love to talk about designing flowers. I love to tell the story of local flowers. So any given Saturday, you can find me at the flower shop. Um, we bought the building about 10 years ago and it's right around the corner from the Waverly Farmer's Market. Um, what I was trying to do with this shop, sorry, the pussy willows are giving me trouble. Um, what I was trying to do with this shop is to capture that feeling that I had at the Towson Farmer's Market all those years ago. I wanted to build a place where people felt like they were part of a community and that they were like rooted in this place of Baltimore. And um, if you've ever come over on Saturdays, the shop is full of a lot of the people that are here in this room today. Um, there's people eating black sauce, there are people making dates and becoming friends, and there's kids and there's dogs, and it's just a really um, fun place to be. And it really has become the heart of everything that we do, even though we do lots of other things. We do weddings, we do corporate events, we do all kinds of things, but Saturday morning is really the heart of what we do. Um, and all the while, while all those people are there, I get to talk to people about local flowers, and I get to tell people where they were from and why they're special and why people should continue to source locally. So all of this probably sounds like a very happy ending to the story, um, and it is. Um, however, um, owning a business, a local business like this, there are challenges to it, right? So um, just like for a lot of the small businesses, probably a lot of the small businesses here today, um, people love our product, they love our mission, they love our values, and the real deal is that our product is more expensive and more difficult to get. That's just the reality of it. So why do people bother? Why do people go out of their way to come to our shop on Saturday morning when they could literally buy flowers at every grocery store, every gas station, every Target that they walk in any time during the week. Um, yes, the flowers are much more amazing. Um, but I honestly believe that people are coming for something else, right? They're coming to feel like they're part of a community. They're coming because they want to spend their money with people that they care about. They want to know John McEwen. They want to know where their flowers came from. So, so, um, so, Baltimore is full of amazing farmers and artists and chefs and creatives and people doing beautiful things. Today, as you leave, I encourage you to seek those people out. Go out of your way to find them and support them. It's important for you, it's important for them, it's important for Baltimore because our city is more fun and more vibrant and more exciting and more beautiful when we have all of these people in it. So go out and support your local people and Know that you are invited to Loco Flow any Saturday morning. Um, I hope you will come and see us. <laughs> Yay! Does anybody cry at Creative Mornings? I have cried at Creative Mornings before, yes. And now it's time for question and answer. Questions. Who has questions for Ellen? I'm going to keep designing while yeah. you ask me questions. All right, I'll start. Come on, Kira, this is a softball. Come on, <laughs> nobody's got a question? Oh, wait, all right. All right, thank you. 
Do your flowers actually smell like flowers? Yes, great question. Um, actually, when you're done today, you can come up and smell these flowers. So um, one of the things that happened when production of cut flowers moved to South America is that the um, corporate growers there um, wanted their flowers to get from like Ecuador to Baltimore um, still alive, right? This is a perishable product, so they're being shipped out of water. Um, and what they had to do to make that happen was to breed scent out of flowers. So when you go to the grocery store and you smell a dozen roses, there's no scent, right? And part of what we love, part of like the, the allure of cut flowers is the fragrance. It is the scent memory that comes with flowers. It is remembering your wedding day or your grandma's backyard. Um, and scent has really been bred out of commercial flowers. Um, so these local flowers um, still smell like flowers are supposed to because they have only traveled less than a mile. Or um, I, Beth Harlan's here today, you know, less than 30 miles. Our flowers come from right close by, so they don't have to worry about using all their energy to smell good and then die. Um, we are getting them from the farm to the shop within a couple hours of being harvested, and yeah, they all smell amazing. Good question. More questions. Hello. Hi. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so my question is, um, what are some of your favorite flowers to work with? Do you yeah. have kind of ones you gravitate towards more yeah. than others? So because we're using locally sourced flowers, what we have in the shop changes every single week. So from week to week, we have favorites. So like this time of year, I mean, for me, tulips are always my favorite. They are my absolute favorite. They're the only flower I really ever had any um, connection to growing up. Uh, so tulips are my favorite. But from week to week, depending on what the growers bring us, we have different favorites. Um, this week is our first week for ranunculus. So this week, ranunculus is our favorite. Um, it changes every week. So if you come over on a Saturday, I will tell you that Saturday what my favorite is. Hi, Tiffany. Um, where are the flowers from that you're working yes, with right yes, now? Yes, 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 yes. That's my question. So that's, that's what I needed. OK. Um, all right, good question. So all of the tulips are from Cut Flowers by Clear Ridge from Union Bridge, Maryland. Like I said, they're 60 miles away. Um, this is a much, much longer discussion. But um, Jessica Todd and I, uh, about eight years ago, worked together to bring winter tulips to Maryland on a, on a big production scale. So we buy all of our winter tulips from Jessica. Um, anemones, butterfly ranunculus, uh, poppies this week are from Butterbee Farm. Everybody probably knows Butterbee Farm. They're amazing. Um, also, let's see, pussy willow is from Tierra Blooms. They're in Tawny Town. Um, and these are really special pussy willows. If you guys come up later, um, Mount Asama is a variety. So in case you want to grow these really pretty pussy willows, they're awesome. Um, let's see, Fantail Willow Eucalyptus from Juniper Farm right here. Where are they? Um, we've got White Forsythia. This is from um, Plant Masters. They're like in Olney. And I think that's everything. These are farmers. Oh, snaps, snaps. We have. Winter snaps, hydroponic snaps um, from Flowers by Bowers. They're a flower farm that have been growing flowers in Jarrettsville for about 50 years. They're a family farm. Uh, we could not get through winter without their snaps. So um, those are the snaps. So every week, uh, the flowers are different. The farmers are different. But these are farmers that we have built relationships with over the last 16 years. Uh, they are, I always say, um, we are all on the same team. Um, when I win, they win, and vice versa. Um, we could not do what we do without the local growers here in our community. Wait, did you want me to go or pass? Oh, okay. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about when you're making the arrangement? You have yeah. Um, yesterday I picked the colors. Uh, I don't get to really make arrangements for myself very often, like things that just I like. So I picked like all the colors that I like. Um, orange is my favorite color to design with. And so there's a lot of orange. Um, 
if, you, if anybody reads my newsletter, yesterday we had an article about unexpected red. So these first um, butterfly ranunculus of the season, I had to put in there because of the unexpected red. Um, so all of, our, all of my designs like usually start with foliage. That's sort of the base. And I always think of foliage as not as like filler, but foliage, like if you go out in the, in the garden or at Silburn, there's flowers, there's foliage, there's branches, all of that gets included. So I usually start with foliage, then line flowers, which are snaps, which you can see like look like a line. Um, then focal flowers, which are more face flowers, like the poppies and enemies round. And then all of the little bits and pieces are like the pussy willow and the forsythia and the fantail. That's like all of the little things that get added into it. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it when I, when I design. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. Thank you. A um, couple questions. Yeah. How many local f growers do you work with, mm -hmm. and how did you find them, or did they find you? How did oh my that God. all happen? <laughs> that could definitely be another talk. Um, OK, right now we, we work with about 40 local growers throughout Maryland and Virginia. We have one grower in Pennsylvania right now, no growers in DC, and no growers in Delaware. Um, sometimes that changes. It just depends on like the year, new growers come, old growers go. Um, but right now, about 40. But every week, like depending on the season, like right now we have some growers that only grow in the winter. So we'll just buy from them right now, and then we won't buy from them in the summer. Um, so right now we buy from about eight to 10 growers um, a week. And during like busy wedding season, that probably extends to maybe 15 or 20. Um, and how we found them, um, all John McEwen. Um, like I said in the presentation, when I started, I didn't know flower farmers. John was literally the only person I knew. And I had a day job. And I kept telling John, like, I would like to do this as my job, but I don't know, like, are there more of you out there? Like, where, where are those people? Um, and John, very graciously, very generously, I mean, John still, you know, we still buy from John every week, uh, very generously invited me to something called the Maryland Cut Flower Growers Association. And I was like, all right, cool. So we drove to Annapolis to this like winter meeting. And when I walked in, there was like 40 growers in there. And I was like, this is it. This is my key to quitting my job and being a florist. Because then I knew that there were farmers out there that grew in the winter and grew in the summer and grew woodies and grew perennials. And I just, that, that first meeting just opened the door to everything for me. So at that meeting, I literally just like took a name, a list of names, and then I called those people and I drove out to their farms and I met with them. And I, a lot of them thought I was crazy, right? Like they were like, this will never, I mean, again, this will never work. People just did not believe that it could work. But we kept coming back week after week after week after week and ordering. And finally, you know, after a couple of years, they were like, okay, I guess, I guess you're gonna stick it out. So, um, yeah, so we, and you know, we have new growers every year. There's growers that start um, and we buy from, and then maybe they stop, and growers that stop and come back. There's just like a whole mix of, and the flower community, you know, like I said, I worked in produce for a long time, and the produce farmers, I never felt that sense of like, um, I don't know, the flower community is really generous with information and they're like all the flower farmers are friends, they share orders, there's just like no like real competition among them. They're just really people who love flowers and so do we, so it's a good fit. That's the growers. We have, oh my goodness, so we're not gonna get to all the questions y'all, but, cause we're running out of time, so we'll do two more quick questions. Hi, I was just wondering what hey, a bad day looks like for you. Wait, who? And how you make yourself feel better. Oh, bad days? When you're having a bad day. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, right, because a lot of people like go to flowers for like bad days. Um, flowers do always make me like still happy. Like there's, there's nothing that has lost their appeal with flowers. Um, but what do I do? I crank up really loud music. If you heard the, I, I made a playlist for today, so I crank up like songs about flowers, which, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I cry a lot, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know, I like to go for walks. Uh, that's kind of it. I mean, the thing is like we don't, at least for work, like there's not like a ton of bad days. Um, 
we have challenges and struggles like every small business, but in terms of like really bad days, they don't, they don't really come a lot. So we're lucky in that way. And there's flowers. We're gonna do, actually I lied, we're gonna do two more quick ones. Here's one of two. Thanks, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm glad I'm not the last question because I have a very kind of tough geopolitical question. Oh yeah, we anticipated it. And since you brought it up about um, Ecuador and Colombia yeah. and the difference between being native and being local, yeah. you're growing, communing with and selling local flowers as opposed to imported flowers um, but they're not native. That's right. Necessarily. And so what would you say to the Colombians, Ecuadorians, Peruvians, people who are here um, listening to the talk? Sure. Who are pride themselves on their pr massive Absolutely. production. Um, how would you, yeah. I would how say would you two, address that? Yeah, I would say two things. One, um, just addressing the issue of natives versus non-natives. Um, as a business, we have stopped using invasive flowers um, foliages, vines, anything that is invasive to our community. So there is still, I mean, this is like a whole, there could be so many talks. Um, there, there's still a lot of use of invasive species in floristry today, and uh, it's a real problem. And so as a business, we have decided not to use invasives anymore. So the flowers that we're using locally sourced here. Some are native, some are non-native, but none of them are invasive. None of them are acting on the environment in the way that invasives do. Um, and then in terms of, right, Colombia and Ecuador and all of the flower growing countries, because those are just the two that import flowers here to the United States. Across Africa, Kenya, um, Kenya specifically, is exporting huge number of roses into Europe right now. And it is true that in a lot of those places, um, flower farming is the thing that um, has, um, has risen those communities sometimes out of poverty um, and sometimes just are jobs that are really, um, are really great jobs for people to have. Um, and I'm all for that. The issue I think for us is the imbalance in, in the loss of local flower farms and the, the high amount of imports. So in the local flower community, we're always trying, this is what people say, we're always trying to chip away at that 80% number. We're always trying to make it, imports are never going away. So the majority of flowers are probably always gonna still come from Colombia and Ecuador. And, and a lot of times, those are, there are good quality flowers coming from those places. But what we're trying to do is sort of balance the playing field a little bit, is to support the local growers to bring back some of that industry um, in the United States. And uh, frankly, whether we want it or not, those imports are gonna continue. So I know that there are places, th there are farms in those places that you know, uh, grow organically, that are Veriflora certified, that are rainforest certified, that um, allow their uh, workers to unionize. Uh, they exist. They are not the norm in those flower growing countries. Um, people are still being exploited. Uh, there are still very low environmental laws in a lot of those places that allow flower farms to use chemicals that are no longer used anywhere in the world. Um, so I think it's a bigger, deeper conversation, but for sure we're just trying to sort of balance the playing field a little bit. Good question. All right, last question. Thank you. Oh. Hi. <laughs> I have a much easier question. We, we practiced questions last night, Eric and I. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, I heard you have a newsletter. <laughs> is, is, it, is it possible for everybody in this room or people watching the recorded presentation to pull out their phones, go to a website, and sign up for this fantastic free weekly newsletter? Oh my God, yes! It's a good thing that my husband is my business partner because he's always looking out for us. So sure, ellenfrost.com.
you can sign up for the newsletter there. It's free, and it's full of these stories and much more. So check it out. Can you all help me thank Ellen? Yeah.